Hello and welcome to another episode of Ty Sharma and Etherin, a Wheel of Time podcast. I, once again, am Will. I'm Sam. And we today are diving in, as I often say. I need to come up with a better metaphor, a different simile of some kind. Fair enough. We're, we're, <laughs> we're jumping into, <laughs> we're, we're, we're heading into, we're, we're venturing forth into the shadow Sally rising. Sally forth. There we go. Yeah, yeah, Sally forth, sallying forth into the shadow rising. And we've got a lot of ground to cover because this is a huge book. A lot happens. And so... Sam, why don't you go ahead and start us off? Yeah, you know, on that note of uh, of of saying the same thing, I've got to stop saying we've said this before, <laughs> because with fourteen or fifteen of these books to go through, we are absolutely going to be broken records on some things. And yes, so just as a general kind of decree, I am going to repeat myself, and I'm going to stop acknowledging it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there, there are probably a lot of phrases that we are just going to be returning to a lot and a lot as we continue to go through. It's like you're saying. I mean, we're going to get repetitive. Mm -hmm. But, but in, yeah. hopefully in an entertaining way. We'll see. <laughs> so <laughs> Hopefully, yes. Not in an annoying way. In, on on yeah. that note, we will, as we usually do we, with these books, we will dive into the interesting prologue. Wait yes. a minute. <laughs> there is no prologue in The Shadow Rising. It's bizarre, really, it, it because is. you've you've come to expect a long prologue, and then, of course, from hereafter, you still have yeah, yeah. quite a few. You know, and chapter one a, really is a prologue. I mean, okay, we start with men's perspective, but then we get some other characters that are so central to this to this book, like High Lady Suroth. <laughs> we get an Elida oh, yeah. perspective, even though we don't have you know the Dark Friend Social or something. This is a long chapter with a bunch of perspectives and it does still feel a bit like a prologue. I don't know if Jordan just was trying something different or if his editor was like, dude, the prologues just drag on. And he's like, okay, <laughs> I'll give you chapter one and still do the same thing. I don't know. It does feel like a prologue, especially beginning with men and, and really it's kind of stepping backward in, in time a little bit because we haven't seen men since the beginning of the previous book. That's right. She doesn't and, know all of what's happened at the end of the last book, for sure. She's as surprised right. as uh, anyone else is when some of the news reaches the White Tower. That's a, that's a good point. So we start right. with men in, in Tarvalan. She is trying to slip into the White Tower incognito um, so that she can go see... Swan Sancha, Sancha, the Amarillo seat. And just because she's incognito, because she doesn't know if there's any Black Aja left, you know, she just kind of wants to stay under the radar. And because Moraine kind of told her she should. She gets onto the tower grounds, and she always sees visions around warders and Aes Sedai. But, like, the first Aes Sedai she sees, she starts seeing this violent imagery and realizes that at least three of them are going to die on the same day, um, which yeah. is a little bit upsetting for her. She doesn't know when. She just knows there's going to be a, a battle and, right. and, and there's going to be a lot of bloodshed. Min meets with Feolane, who asks her name, and uh, she, <laughs> Min responds with her fantastic full, full name, El Mandretta, hoping no one will recognize it other than Swan, Swan the Amberlin. Um, you know, it, it really got me thinking that Min and Fael have a good bit in common. Uh, you know, they both have these oh, yeah. names that they hate. They both have a penchant for knives, kind of both have sort of fiery personalities. To, to right, them. yeah. Like, to Jordan's credit, you can have characters that, as you point out, are, are fairly similar beat for beat, but feel like totally different characters at the same time. Absolutely. They still are degrees of different enough. Yeah, as we'll see in this book, for sure, Fahil has has some things that set her apart. Uh, things that I wouldn't expect men to do, but uh, it'd be interesting to get into that a little bit. So, uh, apparently anyone can request a private audience with the Amarillin seat, but no one does it because they're terrified of her and generally terrified of Aes Sedai in general. So, Fahil's a little bit surprised when, when men, who's pretending to just be this random woman asks to see the Amarillo seat, asks for an audience, but says, okay, we'll, we'll see what we can do. But on her way in to see the Amarillo seat, Min sees one dude who can totally blow her cover, Gawain. Um, and he does. Mm. He sees through her, her attempts at a disguise immediately and interrogates her about Elaine, Nynaeve, Egwene's uh, whereabouts. Conspicuous level of interest in Egwene at this point. 
Yeah. He realizes that quickly that men doesn't know anything more than he does about where they are. <laughs> and this is our first little interaction that gives us a little taste of foreshadowing of, um, of, of a bit of the theme, of one of the themes of this book. Uh, Min gets mad at Gawain when she realizes that he has a crush on Egwene, but he won't tell her about it because Galad has a crush on Egwene too. <laughs> yeah. There are a good many romantic subplots in this book, yeah. maybe more so than others. You know, Will, what it reminds me of a little bit is um, ten things I hate about you. <laughs> oh yeah, this is this is like the the Tolkien teen movie uh, book in a in a little bit. You know, just a little mixture, a little yeah. mixed in. <laughs> I was really worried you were going to say it was, reminds you of like our senior year of high school or something. <laughs> I just as soon oh. forget. <laughs> Dang. Yeah, I would. For, I would just as soon forget myself. Honestly, we have this love dodecagon kind of thing that happens because of all the different complex relationships and uh, people, you know, some of whom are good for each other, some of whom are not really great for each other, mm -hmm. that are interested in one another, people that are clearly not meant to get together, but are kind of, you know, there's just a lot of different complex relationships happening. And that starts to come to kind of a bit of a head in this with as you say, just there's a couple of different love triangle kind of situations. Yeah. You know, I thought a good bit about this, you know, an uncharitable view, uh, a ta hot take on this, if you'd say that, uh, might call it juvenile or even corny. Right. Uh, but I, the more I think about it, it, it just, it can feel adorable, endearing. And, and maybe that's just me having some nostalgia for it from when I was, from when I was a kid. But, you know, you contrast that to, you know, again, the Game of Thrones, just so much less dark. Game of Thrones is, is, all of the romance is about rape, incest, arranged marriage, rape within marriage, you know, death at the hand of your true love. I mean, they're, they're only examples of, of healthy marriages in Game of Thrones tend to not end well, like Catelyn and Ned Stark. <laughs> I mean, yeah. like the... So it, it's it's very different in that sense, but I, I don't know. I, I like it. I like that, you know, there's this focus on the awkwardness of like teenagers and or young adults interacting with the opposite sex and, and a right. feeling like they don't know what they're know what to say or know what to do. Um, so I don't know. I really hope that they, they don't kind of skip that, that they just kind of lean into it a little bit. And yeah, maybe it's corny. Maybe it's ridiculous. Maybe it can be a bit CW at times, but I don't know. I think it just fits with the whole feel for these books. Oh, for sure. Well, and I've seen people complain about the romance in these books not feeling real or feeling cheesy, like you're saying. But at the same time, I'm looking at it, I'm going, these are people, they're they're like teenagers or freshly in their 20s. They haven't seen the world. A lot of them, they're, they're kind of, they're kind of awkward. And that makes this feel actually kind of realistic to me that this might yeah. be the way that they would interact that yeah it might seem a little cheesy because that's the way that they know how to do it exactly no I, yeah it, at first i was kind of like reading this again after so many years was like some groan inducing like oh man this is ridiculous but the more i thought about it it, it just kind of like this is part of what these books are and i enjoy it i'm, I'm not going to apologize for that i just i i think it's a pro not a con Conversation with Gawain over, Min totally checks him out as he walks away, <laughs> thinking about how he's adopting the dangerous grace of a warder and smoothing her dress. She's wearing a dress, so she has to smooth it. Of course. That's as important. There better be dress smoothing there better in this be TV show. Very clear dress smoothing. It's very true. Once she gets into the Amberlin study, Jordan gives a pretty detailed description of Swan. Um, she was sturdy and handsome rather than beautiful, and the only bit of ostentation on her clothing was the broad stole of the Amberlin seat she wore. Her sharp blue eyes brooked no nonsense, and her firm jaw spoke of the determination of the youngest woman ever to be chosen Amaryllis. Yeah. Min makes an awkward curtsy, mainly because a bow would have been dumb looking in a dress, tries to tell Swan about the scene she saw of Aes Sedai and Warders dying. Amaryllis pretty much brushes it off because doesn't have any solid details, and frankly, Swan has enough to worry about. Can't really do anything about it. Um, at least she thinks she does. It really sort of begs the question... Could Swan even stop that day from happening if she tried? I mean, doesn't the things men see happen no matter what? I mean, hindsight being 2020, it's easy to see her as being overly dismissive, wrapped up in her own scheming. Well, I guess it's kind of after her conversation with Swan that we get into the whole business of she wants men to stick around and 
kind of makes her almost a prisoner. She does. Absolutely. Yeah. That, yeah, I was just getting into that. Um, so Min gets angry when she realizes that the Amaralyn wants to control Rand as much as Moraine does. I mean, but obviously, come on, man, you should, (laughs) that shouldn't be surprising to you. If anything, she would want him more as a political pawn. Exactly. And, but in her, with her reaction, Swan realizes, realizes that Min has the hots for Rand. (laughs) So that, uh, uh, so Amaral, the Amaralyn makes her admit to her viewings about Rand, go put on a fancy dress and, (laughs) uh, you know, lean into this El Mandretta role and, you know, to do the same thing that she had Egwene and Nynaeve do, which was try to hunt out the Black Aja because she doesn't know if she can trust anyone else. But she knows men isn't a dark. Men's viewings are kind of an interesting thing throughout the series because there's the whole business of they can never be prevented is what it seems. Um, right. But also, what do, does that make them at all useful. Yeah. I mean, that's a completely fair question. I mean, it seems like more often than not, she'll tell like, you know, last book, she told Perrin about uh, the tinker woman dying. And so he was like worried about it, trying to figure out how to stop it. She still died. It's like, well, okay. I mean, that's great. Yeah. What is right. What does that (laughs) do for me? Other than just kind of making him a little more emo. Right. Yeah. And it it does kind of present a uh, a question throughout the series as this read read goes along. I'm sure we'll run into it and encounter it if it's ever, ever the case. But largely, I don't think of her viewings as being all that helpful. Yeah, I can't I can't think of one that has been either. Honestly, I mean it's it's interesting and it feels like foreshadowing, just kind of like Egwene's dream sequences. Uh, right, but it almost never helps. It seems, uh, but that's a that's a fair question. Yeah. So next we get an Elida perspective. Great. <laughs> it's really <laughs> enough for us to be sure she isn't Black Aja and equally sure that she is all around awful. <laughs> she runs she into... Is. She's just a terrible, she terrible is. person. You know, it's like, like you've mentioned before, you know, like we get Galad's perspective and it gives you, makes you feel a little bit more sympathetic to him. Not with Elida. <laughs> right. Not even a little bit. Yeah, Elida, the one thing that you're sure about is that Elida is completely self-centered. Yeah. And there's just nothing likable about her. There's, like, later on when we find out who's in the Black Aja, you actually like some of the people yeah, in the Black exactly. Aja more than you do Elida. You're like rooting for the shadow just a little bit, like, take Elida out. You're right. She runs into Alvier and starts scheming about how to take down Swan, of course, not knowing anything about Alvier. We have a Dane Bornhold perspective who is in Terran Ferry with a contingent of white cloaks. Padon Fane is with him, um, still going by the name Ordeeth. As with everyone else, Ordeeth helps. Dane realizes the dude is nuts, but he just wants to use him. I just think it's funny that the entity known as Mordith that has inhabited Padon Fane has decided to go with the totally different name or D <laughs> the artist formerly known as Mordith. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, just, yeah. Yeah. It's like really like, going oh, under no. the radar there. Just right pop off the M and yeah. Add an I, um, after that high lady, sir. Right. That's the last perspective before we get to a real chapter one, but chapter two, um, she's interrogating a former Aes Sedai who is a Damani named Pura. And she's pure assured that the Aes Sedai wouldn't help a false dragon because course she's sure that rand is a false dragon doesn't really have all the information she's gotten the memo that her that soul dom can channel and doesn't trust those anymore and that's pretty much it that you know it's just kind of a, a checking in with her so to speak yeah i've seen this pie chart that explains what the real problems in the wheel of time are and it's like a section of it is like the dark one that's the big section but it's like still a small section and then the white cloaks and then the Sean Chan and then the rest of it is bad communication. 100%. And yeah. <laughs> I feel, <laughs> I feel like most of it is just people who don't have all the information continuing to perpetuate that lack of information. And often willfully avoiding getting the information. Right. Like Matt is egregious egregious for doing this you know all the time just like if you would just go talk to rand or perrin or moran yeah or just i don't care somebody <laughs> yeah be willing to listen to an Aes Sedai every now and right, then right right yeah you would 
definitely be further ahead than you are. Okay, on to chapter two then? Yeah, to add to my observations about the lack of a prologue, chapter two begins with the wind blowing across the fingers of the dragon. So it's like, he didn't doesn't quite do the, the chapter one intro, you know, the usual blurb, but always begins a book with the wind blowing. So it's like, I gotta believe he just renamed chapter one to the prologue, or prologue yeah. to chapter one, but not important, just can't help but point it out. We begin with a dramatic scene. Fayil is telling Perrin that his beard is totally hot and uh, really trying to convince him not to shave it. <laughs> uh, but she also wants him to leave the Stone of Tear because she's convinced Rand will go mad and break the world like Luce Theron did. I just feel the need to point out, yeah. by the way, that Robert Jordan had a beard. Yes, indeed he did. <laughs> and I feel like this is, this is a, I don't know, some kind of little funny wish fulfillment thing where he's like this idea of this woman that just insists you have to have a beard. I don't know. Either that or, or maybe Harriet was a fan of the beard and, and that's really what it was. He, yeah, it does make you wonder a little bit if, if his marriage is like Fayul and Perrin's relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Which relationship in these books uh, most reflects? Right, you gotta figure um, one of them. A cock crows, and Fael says it means someone is going to die. I mean, dang, is, as omens go, that one seems kind of commonplace. I mean, is someone going right. to die every day when the sun comes up? Yeah, and is it for every crow? Because, like, anybody who's lived anywhere near where there's... They will not roosters. shut up. And it will be in the yes. middle of the day, and they'll still be crowing. Like, <laughs> like yeah, dude, we know. It's been <laughs> up for hours. <laughs> it's true. They're not smart. She's nearly proved right in this case when Perrin's axe jumps up and tries to murder him. Oh yeah. You know, this will be a this could be a funny and sinister scene to watch, assuming we get this far. It's a great line. It wanted Perrin. He knew that as if it had shouted at him, but it fought with cunning. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I do yeah, I do feel like this has to be played a little bit for some humor. Yeah. Because otherwise I just I, I don't know how you can not make a disembodied axe just coming at you not look a little silly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you, if you play too straight, it's going to be like, okay, God. <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is ridiculous. So he manages to shove Fayil out of the room um, to wrestle with the axe by himself. And he does manage to stop it by sort of plunging it into the, uh, into the door. And he f- opens the door to find it has almost split Fayil's head in half on the other, ha- on the other side. Um, and that's enough to sort of start, stop their argument. <laughs> yes. He hugs, kisses, and then slaps him across the face, which defines the way their relationship will go for the rest of the series, yes. more or less. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> she isn't mad with him anymore. The possessed axe has put things into perspective. Tends to. I know the times that I've been um, attacked by, by an, axe. an axe. Yeah. Yeah. Not really. Fayol thinks it has to have been Rand going mad because that's the thing she goes to these days. And so, they're, so what they're, what they're going to do is go confront him about it, I guess, or go ask him about it. So on to Matt, who's gambling as usual with some Tyran nobles. A little anecdote about Matt playing Maiden's Kiss with Maidens of the Spear and, and <laughs> exactly what that means. And the nobles are gossiping about what they think Rand is going to do with Tyr. And of course, all of them want to go to war with Ilian because... They hate Ilian, and that's their thing. Um, right. Matt wins the hand and accidentally mutters something in the old tongue, which is what he does. And, of course, yeah, that's kind of his, yeah, his kind jam of his, these days. Uh, then one of the playing tra- cards tries to kill him. <laughs> it's uh, the face right. of the Amarillan seed, of course, and just attacks him with a knife. And the cards right. kind of as, grow. As tends to happen from time to time. <laughs> right. So the cards grow larger and, like, all the face cards and figures step out of them with weapons. And Matt manages to pin them to the wall with knives and they go back to being cards. And Matt also comes to the conclusion that this is Rand's fault. And the nobles, uh, understandably, want nothing to do with this kind of crazy stuff, so they peace out. Matt rips all the cards in two, just in case, even though they've turned back into playing cards, and does not go looking for Rand, unlike Perrin. So then we finally get a proper Rand perspective, which we were severely lacking in the last book, and I know some people prefer it that way, but I don't know, I kind of like... I kind of like old Mr. Rand Althor. I like to... Well, at this point, you're kind of ready for it. Even if you're not a big fan of Rand, you would end up feeling kind of like, hey, I've, I want to hear from this guy after... And he still isn't... It's not as though we get a ton of his perspectives in this book. We do get right. we get a lot more than in the last book. But this one is still kind of a, a good mixture of, of, of character yeah. characters in this one. Well, and this really sets the pace for the way it's going to be for the rest of the series. Right, is that, right. You know, you check good in balance. with Rand every now and then, but you're going to spend even a few chapters at a time with other characters. Right, be it Egwene, Perrin, Matt, for sure. Rand dreams about Moraine 
prodding him with a stick, skinny dipping with Elaine, Min, and Avienda. Uh, and our boy still has not gotten the memo that he and Egwene aren't meant for each other. So he wakes up and feels bad about the whole thing. I mean, I don't know why. It's not like you can control your dreams. At least he can't. <laughs> he probably wishes he could at <laughs> sometimes. So he wakes up from this dream and realizes he's not alone. Jumping, and then he jumps out of the, his bed in his underwear. <laughs> Sees his right, side is, I love the use the use of the word small clothes, I think. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's just a funny way of saying underwear. Right, right. Yeah, so he jumps out in his small clothes, sees his sidene, and summons his sidene sword. Uh, so we have an interesting tidbit here. The sword made from the one power isn't warm to the touch. Uh, this is something I had wondered about when he fought Ishmael. It's not, even though it's made out of fire, he's, it's not burning him or anything, which makes sense. Then uh, Rand realizes Barrelaine is in the room with him, getting ready to slip into his bed. <laughs> and what does she lead with? I'm unarmed. I submit myself to your search if you doubt me. So this is where we really get to know Barrelaine right. for the first time. And it's quite the introduction. It is. Uh, for It's like, geez, lady, ever heard of playing hard to get? I mean, on the other hand, for a magic-using ruler destined to destroy or save the world, Rand is really awkward with the ladies. It's true. You have to admire his resolve a little, though. I mean, you know, don't you? Because, uh, or maybe a sense of loyalty to Egwene when a pretty lady is standing in front of him in lingerie, really intent on seducing him. And also, you know, just the scene is generally just a little awkward to read. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it is. It's especially funny to listen to because Michael since Kramer. It's, yeah, since it's a Rand perspective <laughs> chapter, it's Michael Kramer reading it. Reading Barrelane's so voice. You get yeah, you get Barrelane's voice. I saw somebody. I think it was on the Wheel of Time subreddit that said, "I don't care anything else about casting. Whoever they cast as Barrelane, they have to dub over Michael Kramer's Barrelane voice." Um, exactly. whoever they have. Oh my goodness. It would just be brilliant if they, you know, have this gorgeous woman and she has this this guy who's doing this breathy kind of voice. Oh, I submit to your search if you don't believe me. <laughs> oh man, I mean lines like this. Your arms look as strong as stone. If you think you must be harsh with me, then be harsh so long as you hold me. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, I mean it's, you know, it's not the most attractive thing in the world for someone to just throw themselves at a person like that in a <laughs> naked, naked grab for power. I also think that it's not just out of loyalty to Egwene or whatever. I think some of it is a sense of propriety that comes from, you know, being raised in the country. But also, I think the primary thing is at this point, Rand is fully aware of who he is. Right. And and while he's still in the process of accepting it and finding out what that means, I think he does realize what that means for other people. Right. And that and she's not just there because she thinks he's hot. You know, she's really is trying to, you know, get, right. get something from him. Right. And so even if she were sincere, him being close to anybody is not really great for them. Yeah, that's a that's a good point, too, that he, he is. Also thinking about, you know, he doesn't want, you know, this woman to die because she's close to him. And of course, Berylaine has no clue. She's really, it, it, it's an unusual situation because we, we meet Berylaine and she's so rarely caught off guard. And yet, and yet she is, is definitely caught off guard in this case. Yes. Um, yeah. His, we, we, it's, his first reaction is to shove her away with a wall of air and, right. you know, uh, and tie off the weave, just kind of putting a wall up there. And, and then even as that happens, she still, even though she's scared as heck, she still tries to seduce him. <laughs> she's right. And, and the, so this was this was a great line. Even sheltered in emptiness as he was, he gaped at her. If the defenders of the stone had been half as determined as this woman, half as steadfast in purpose, 10,000 Aiel could never have taken the stone. <laughs> right. Yes. Berlin is shown to be fairly unflappable and right, in, right. in general when she wants something she's going to get go after it uh -huh. and until she really is defeated in that sense she's a, a good ally in the long run oh, yeah. yeah but also a, a very formidable foe <laughs> when <laughs> <In this> she's <laughs> yeah when she's coming after you uh, of course then Rand has 
bigger problems on his hand when his own reflection steps out of every mirrored surface in the room and right. tries to kill him. And this is a little creepier than the axe or the playing cards. Rand gets the feeling that if he loses the fight, one of his evil reflections will take his place, just like an evil doppelganger will become Rand. It makes me think of how the Dark One would remake the pattern in his image if he ever really gets out of prison and, and, and wins the fight. Right. That whole situation is enough to unnerve Bear Lane. And um, after Rand finishes killing off all his reflections um, and lets her go, she makes a beeline for the door. <laughs> <laughs> yep. At that point, and you're kind of like, yeah, yeah, that would be a good time to to leave. I would have left before that. Yes. But yeah, a, a lot know. of people wouldn't have been there in the first place <laughs> <laughs> in this man's room in the middle of the night with him sleeping. <laughs> so Perrin and Fayil make their way through the stone on their way to find Rand. And uh, Perrin gets some for some reason, Perrin keeps getting self-conscious about his golden eyes. I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Like, dude, no one cares. I mean, like, there's a lot of like big stuff going. No one cares about the. Gold. Yeah, the the Dragon Reborn has just you know taken the Stone of Tear. Pretty much everybody is occupied with that. Yes. Then he gets snippy with High Lord Torian when the nor- nobleman looks Fayil up and down, which uh, Fayil likes that he's jealous. And again, there's entirely too much of this sort of thing. I mean, ten minutes ago, an axe came alive and tried to murder them both. And Perrin is getting jealous when some dude checks out his kind of on-again, off-again girlfriend. Right. Uh, then they run into Barrel Lane and fleeing Ranch Chambers. And it's Fael's turn to get jealous um, because Perrin starts to say she smells afraid. But Fael cuts him off and says, I don't care if she smelled of the essence of the dawn. They have another back and forth and Fael just kind of leaves. Uh, leaves it there. Yeah. Doesn't really understand what he was saying. Perrin goes into Rand's room and finds broken glass everywhere, and Rand is covered in blood like Carrie. I mean, he is just completely covered in blood. Perrin calls for Moraine, and uh, both Ruark and Land show up, and we get a fun line. Land and Ruark's icy blue stairs nearly struck sparks. <laughs> That'll be fun to see yep. those two interact with each other. Yeah, these two characters are, it's funny because they're fairly similar from from very different cultures, but both kind of warrior cultures. Right. So Moraine attempts to heal Ran using the aid of him embracing Sidene, but he's unable to grasp the void. And he's at this point kind of getting uh, a little bit fed up with his whole state and station in life because he can't control his channeling and oh yeah so very true too. that's going to be so, a theme throughout this book really and that's kind of what leads into the next book is is the fact that he is super powerful but doesn't really know what he's doing exactly uh, and also this is where <laughs> moraine explains the bubbles of evil yeah fantastic that, concept as if we didn't have enough to worry about already she says like bubbles rising from the things rotting on the bottom of a pond that drift through the pattern until they attach to a thread and burst Great. And I had forgotten that that Bubbles of Evil really showed up this early in the series. They become so much more common and prominent in the later books. And they get crazier and crazier, weirder, creepier. Yeah, that's Um, a very good point. Yeah, it is kind of a it it makes for some interesting reading just to, to see the ways that these bubbles of evil can warp the pattern. Right. So they're, and, and part of the reason that we see them so often is because they're attracted to Taviran, who's, you know, caused the pattern to swirl around them. So the bubbles of evil drift towards them. That's why Matt, sure. Rand, Perrin all experience them. Uh, everyone leaves and the maidens threaten to clean Rand up if he doesn't stand up on his own. Uh, Perrin and Ruark speak briefly and Ruark tells Perrin that Rand still hasn't proven that he is their chosen one, that he is he who comes with the dawn. And Perrin sort of asks, uh, well, what would you do if he isn't? And <laughs> Rourke kind of leaves it kind of open-ended, like, well... He's like, hey, we'll, we'll probably, cross that bridge yeah. when we come to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it might not be pleasant. We'll see. <laughs> so, uh, chapter four. What do you know? An honest-to-goodness Tom Marilyn perspective chapter. Yes, Garrett, he is a major character. I officially take back my words. <laughs> uh, <laughs> had a little discussion with a buddy there about that. Um, Tom is forging a letter to High Lord Carlo- Carleon, when Matt shows up and tells him about getting attacked by playing cards, Matt blames Rand, of course, to, to Tom. The difference between him and Perrin is he doesn't bother to go ask Rand. He just kind of blames him and certainly isn't going yep. to look for Moraine's opinion. Tom wonders to himself why he ever got involved, but also really feels like Rand would be worse off without his help. Right. Uh, they have a sort of unspoken conversation about how unfair it is to be Tavirin. 
Matt asks mm-hmm. Tom, uh, we'll just, you know, let's get out of here. But Tom, you know, knows that Matt needs to stay and honestly doesn't know if he could leave. So he kind of convinces him to wait until morning. And then this and kind of and sit around, have a drink, play, play some stones. But the, the ending of this is just so great. Tom starts to tell a story about a bet he made with a Domani woman who had a parrot she claimed could tell the future. And I really want to know what I want to hear the rest of this story. Right. Yeah. Come on. Like, That's awesome. so what did the parrot say? I, know. I feel like we could write a whole book on the story of the Damani woman with the parrot yes. who could see the future. Absolutely. Thanks, Jordan, for teasing us with that one. Yeah. Uh, that's a good place to pause for now. Like I said, we're going to have some shorter episodes so we can do a weekly show for the next few weeks anyway. And just as always, we want to ask you to rate us, to like us, to share us, to send us an email, comment on our Instagram, follow us on Twitter, all of that good stuff. You can find links to that our website, tsmpodcast.com, and all of our um, social media is Podcast TSM. Uh, We couldn't quite work it out to get both of those all lined up. So Podcast TSM on Twitter, Podcast TSM on Instagram, and on Facebook. So follow us on all of those. And until next time, Taishara Manetherin.